Good afternoon. I'm Chris Fanta. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our Asthma Grand Rounds and also to welcome those of you who are joining us by live webcasting. Uh, and before we begin, I would like to take a minute to uh, acknowledge the passing of uh, Dr. Al Sheffer in late uh, December. Uh, he was our leader, our mentor, our friend. He touched the lives of so many of us here in the audience and nationwide and worldwide and uh, uh, was beloved by thousands of his uh, patients. And, uh, We'll miss his uh, presence, uh, but it's his legacy that will live on for many generations through uh, those of us who are here. And uh, he would have loved today's program, and I'm sorry he can't be here, but I would like to, and I guess we're going to continue this way, uh, introduce our program uh, today. We have three outstanding allergists from the uh, Partners Asthma Center who are joining us to give us an update on allergen immunotherapy and its role in allergic diseases and asthma. Perhaps I can introduce you in the order that you're going to be speaking. Dr. John Costa is a medical director of the Brigham's Allergy and Clinical Immunology Practice. Ellen Dutta is a member of the Allergy and Immunology Group at the Mass General Hospital. And Dr. Aidan Long is the clinical director of the Allergy and Immunology Program at Mass General Hospital. And we are delighted to have you here for a series of presentations and then a panel discussion about the role of allergen immunotherapy in the modern era. Dr. Costa first. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to have the chance to uh, to be here. I also would like to dedicate my section of this lecture to Chef, um, who was a, a dedicated, inspiring mentor, a, a thoughtful and caring friend, and someone who we will always remember and miss. Um, so uh, Aiden told me I have 12 minutes to uh, discuss all of allergen immunotherapy history and immunologic mechanisms, give or take a minute. Um, I have no relevant financial uh, disclosures. So I thought it was important to start by making sure we were all on the same page in terms of a few important uh, basic definitions. So the first is just the term immunotherapy. And these definitions come from the uh, third update of the practice parameter put out by the uh, American Academy of Allergy and the uh, American College of Allergy. Uh, that were last uh, updated in 2011. So the term immunotherapy refers to all methods used to overcome an abnormal immune response with induction of clonal deletion, energy, immune tolerance, or immune deviation. Within that broad topic of immunotherapy, allergen immunotherapy refers to a specific subset in which the repeated administration of specific allergens to patients with proven IgE-mediated conditions for the purpose of providing protection against the allergic symptoms and inflammatory reactions associated with natural exposure to those allergens. That is to be contrasted with the term desensitization which is distinct and refers to the rapid administration of incremental doses of allergens, oftentimes medications, starting with like one molecule and, and working your way up, uh, by which effector cells are rendered less reactive or non-responsive to an IgE-mediated immune response. And we're really not 100% sure how that works. It can involve IgE-mediated or other immune mechanisms. Some terms that you'll see used, just to make sure we're all, again, on the same page. SCIT, S-C-I-T, refers to subcutaneous allergen-specific immunotherapy, which in the rest of my slides will be abbreviated as AIT, and is the tried and true, most uh, long-lived and most frequent uh, type of allergen immunotherapy that has been used to treat human disease. 
EPIT refers to epicutaneous immunotherapy. SLIT is sublingual immunotherapy. OIT is oral immunotherapy. And ILIT refers to intralymphatic immunotherapy. So this is the, this, uh, this is the history slide, don't blink. Um, allergen immunotherapy historical perspectives go as far back as 1819, when a gentleman named Bostock, who was a London physician, precisely described his own personal experience and classical case of seasonal hay fever. In 1890, Wyman, working in the United States, identified pollen as the cause of his autumnal catarrh, a term I've always found so graphic. 1891, Blackley, based on self-experimentation, uh, probably did not go through an IRB, uh, established that grass pollen was the non-infective cause of his seasonal catarrh, and this is the first investigational reference to allergen immunotherapy. He repeatedly applied grass pollen to his abraded skin, but did not achieve any clinical efficacy. Few, few years later, in 1900, Curtis reported that immunizing injections of watery extracts of certain pollens appeared to benefit patients with coryza or asthma caused by those pollens. And it was in 1914, almost exactly 100 years ago, that Noon and Freeman reported the results of the first immunotherapy trial of 84 patients treated for three years with grass pollen extracts. And in that report, they were able to show successful clinical outcomes with acquired immunity lasting for one year after discontinuation of treatment. So before we can talk about immunotherapy mechanisms, we need to be sure that we're all understanding what is the allergic condition at an immunologic level. So I like to start all my lectures about allergy and allergic inflammation by making sure we realize that the correctly functioning, the healthy immune system does two things right all the time. First, it correctly identifies and then ignores self versus appropriate recognition of non-self. And when that fails, you end up with autoimmune conditions. The second thing your immune system, system should do correctly each and every time it identifies something different from itself is to identify and ignore harmless non-self versus responding to harmful non-self. And when that breaks down and doesn't work correctly, that is how we end up with allergic diseases. So understand that the healthy state, the normal state, is to be non-allergic. And 80% of the US population is non-allergic. Only one in five individuals suffer with allergic diseases. So that normal healthy state is achieved by either allergens not being recognized by the immune system or through the establishment and maintenance of specific immune tolerance to allergens. So how, how does this work at an immunologic level? I would like to remind everyone that there are, have been shown to be subsets of CD4 positive T cells that are, can be allergen specific that are derived from naive T cells that can differentiate by different pathways based on what cytokines are present in the milieu into the Th1 subset in that aspect of an immune response, which is beneficial for clearance of intracellular pathogens, immunopathology, but also plays a role in autoimmunity. And each one of these T cell subsets has a specific transcription factor. Under the influence of interleukin-4, naive T cells differentiate into so-called Th2 helper cells, which use the GATA3 transcription factor. These are important in clearance of extracellular pathogens and play a role in allergy and atopy. Under the influence of TGF-beta and IL-6, Th17 helper cells are generated, which also play a role in immunopathology and autoimmunity. If 
the, the cytokine milieu is correct. Those naive T cells can be induced, instead of forming immunoreactive helper cells, to develop tolerant tolerance through T regulatory cells, which are inducible. That's what the I refers to. Peripheral inducible T regulatory cells, which are recognized by the use of the Fox P3 transcription factor. So all of these subsets are present in all individuals, but in different proportions depending on healthy versus allergic. In healthy subjects, these Treg cells, which produce high levels of IL-10, are the dominant subset. There are real-life models that mimic this condition in, in high-dose allergen exposure. These are the beekeepers who are stung multiple, multiple, multiple times, as well as the cat owners who have you know, 10 or 15 cats sleeping with them in bed every night. And in these individuals, the Treg cells, which are specific for the major allergens in either the bee venom or the cat saliva, are the major T cell subset. So the allergic condition occurs when allergens are presented by dendritic cells to naive T cells, causing the production of the T helper 2 subset of, of CD4 cells. And this results in production of a variety of pro-allergic inflammatory cytokines that can activate the effector cells of allergy, which include mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. Under the influence of IL-4, that's part of that Th2 response, B cells are induced to produce IgE. That IgE binds to the high affinity IgE receptor on the surface of mast cells and basophils. And when re-exposed to allergen, mast cells and basophils cross-link their high affinity IgE receptors, activate the cells, resulting in the release of a variety of vasoactive amines, such as histamine, lipid mediators, prostaglandins, cystine and leukotrienes, as well as a number of cytokines. Uh, omitted from this would be an important cytokine, TNF, uh, as well as chemokines. And it's this mixture of pro-inflammatory mediators that results in allergic inflammation. So the key point is that repeated or continuous allergen exposure causes chronic allergic inflammation and that allergic patients have a high frequency of CD4 positive, allergen specific, IL-4 secreting Th2 cells. So that's the condition. How do we undo it? How does allergen immunotherapy work? I'm going to suggest to you that there have been demonstrated to be four major mechanisms, the first of which is a very rapid desensitization. So early on, evident within the very first injection of an allergen, there is an increase in the threshold for allergen-induced mast cell and basophil degranulation. To achieve this, you must use 3D structure-intact allergens. This is similar to the effect of rapid drug desensitization that I mentioned in our definition phase. We think the mechanism involves very low levels of mediator release because we're starting out using very minimal quantities of the allergen, and that this results in an increase in the threshold for mast cell and basophil activation. Some of the evidence for this is based on studies in venom and immunotherapy in which within six hours of the first administration, there is a rapid upregulation of the type 2 histamine receptor on basophils with subsequent suppression of the high affinity IgE receptor induced basophil activation and mediator release. The second mechanism of action and potentially the most important is the development of allergen specific immune tolerance. And this occurs through the generation of peripheral inducible allergen specific Tregs called TR1s and recent evidence demonstrates there are also B regulatory cells referred to as BR1 cells. The TR1 and BR1 cells produce high levels of IL-10 and suppress allergen-specific CD4 T cell proliferation. The Treg cells also secrete TGF-beta and express cell surface suppressor molecules such as CTLA-4 and PD-1, which can further dampen immune responses. 
suppression of cytokine release from allergen-specific Th2 cells, and there is a deviation towards the Th1 cytokine profile, and altogether the combined effect is a long-lived decrease in allergen-specific T cell responsiveness. To review this graphically, peripheral, naive CD4 cells, pre-existing T effector cells are induced in the peripheral lymph nodes to become peripheral T reg cells. In the lymph nodes, we think this is where the important action for subcutaneous Im immunotherapy, possibly SLIT, to create these IT reg cells with a predominant IL-10 profile. And in the gut, there's a sister type population referred to as the TH3 cell, which predominantly produces TGF beta and may be what's relevant for slit or oral immunotherapy. The TH3 cells are a subgroup of the Tregs derived primarily from the gut that generate mucosal tolerance and induce secretory IgA production. The third potential mechanism of allergen immunotherapy deals with regulation of antibody isotypes, and there are two effects here. The first is effects on IgE. For a long time, it has been known that there is a transient increase in allergen-specific IgE levels after you start immunotherapy, followed by a very slow and gradual decrease over months or, ye of, or years of continued treatment. In untreated individuals, every pollen season results in an increase in IgE specific for the allergens to which the individu individual is exposed. When you're on immunotherapy, that seasonal increase is blunted, but this is unlikely to be causal because the decrease in IgE occurs late and correlates poorly with the clinical improvement of allergen immunotherapy. The second effect on antibody isotypes has to do with IgG. M virtually all studies show increased levels of allergen-specific IgG4, which is due to an actual enhancement in B cell class switching from IgG to I sorry from IgE to IgG4, and then IgG4 acts as a so-called blocking antibody to capture allergen and prevent it from binding to the IgE that's bound to the high affinity IgE receptor on mast cells and basophils. And this binding blocking will inhibit allergen-induced activation or degranulation of mast cells and basophils. It can also limit T cell activation done through uh, CD3, CD23 mediated IgE facilitated allergen presentation, and overall there is a decrease in allergen-specific IgE to IgG4 ratio. The final and fourth mechanism of action is a decreased end organ sensitivity, which you don't see until an individual has been on immunotherapy for many months. But in such individuals, you can demonstrate decreased numbers of tissue mast cells and eosinophils, decreased release of mast cell cytokines and eosinophil mediators such as eosinophil cationic protein, and these decreases correlate with decreased bronchial hyperreactivity as well as clinical improvement. There's reduction in the immediate and late phase response to allergen provocation that has been demonstrated in skin in the nose, as well as in bronchial mucosa, and in clinical trials, you see this as a reduction in type 1 skin test sensitivity. There is an increase in the allergen concentration necessary to induce immediate and late phase responses, and there is a decrease in bronchial, nasal, and conjunctival hyperreactivity to non-specific stimuli, which in the lab can be histamine, and in the real world can be diesel fumes or dust or whatever. But there's a decreased end organ responsiveness. So 
In all of this, I want to emphasize that there's clearly a key role for IL-10 in allergen immunotherapy-induced immune tolerance. It promotes a non-inflammatory phenotype. It inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokine production from dendritic cells, mast cells, eosinophils, polys. It inhibits the Th1 and Th2 cell activation through effects on both antigen-presenting cells as well as inhibition of T-cell CD28 co-stimulation. It enhances B cell survival and increased class switching to IgG4 production. It inhibits eosinophil survival in tissues, and it inhibits mast cell activation. So graphically, allergen immunotherapy induces development of allergen-specific immune tolerance by a delicate balance between Th2 cells and Treg cells controlling either the development or suppression of allergic inflammation. When the TH2 cell is dominant, you have direct and indirect activation of effector cells. You have induction of B cells for IgE production. When the Treg cells are dominant, you suppress the B cell to induce IgG4 and produce less IgE. The Breg cell also contributes in this regard. There are direct and indirect suppressor effects on the mast cells, basophils and eosinophils, as well as suppression of Th2 homing to tissues through the endothelial cells. So, to end, from the allergist perspective, and these are quotes from two very recent one, the international consensus on allergen immunotherapy, the other, a, a consensus a group from both European and United States allergists, immunologists. Allergen immunotherapy is the only potential disease-modifying treatment for allergic subjects, and, quote, it can change the course of disease by altering the underlying natural history, which is the allergic inflammatory pathology. And on that note, I will turn this over to Dr. Dutta, who will now tell you how we go about making this small miracle happen. Good afternoon, and I want to thank Chris and Aiden for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation today. And I also have memories of Dr. Sheffer. He, uh, he paved the way for Mass General West in Waltham. And even just yesterday, I had a patient who um, had been seeing Dr. Sheffer for 30 years before um, switching to Dr. Banerjee and then to me um, in follow-up in uh, Waltham. So there is uh, so many ways that he touched everyone's lives. Uh, so I'm going to turn to the practical side of prescribing subcutaneous immunotherapy, which remains what we consider our classical or conventional treatment. Um, the main thing to start with, uh, when, you re when you refer a patient uh, to allergy, what we're going to want to do first is confirm the presence of specific IgE antibodies. And then we need to confirm the correlation with the clinical symptoms and exposure by history. And then I'll go over the method and protocol for subcutaneous immunotherapy and discuss the risks of immunotherapy, and Aiden will address more of the benefits and evidence for efficacy, particularly in asthma. So allergy testing looks something like this. Um, we perform prick testing with, there's different gadgets. Um, this is one device known as the Greer Pick that we happen to use. Uh, this is basically dipped into the allergy extract for each item, an individual prick, and applied to the arms. It can be also be applied to the back, usually the arms for us. And we wait 15 minutes and we look for a wheel and flare. That's evidence, clinical evidence of the IgE antibody in the skin reacting to that particular allergen. Uh, we use a histamine control and a diluent as a negative control to make sure we're um, having an accurate reading. We measure the wheel and flare and uh, uh, that's our result. Some practices will move on to intradermal testing. This shows shown here on the third picture, which is just a small um, intradermal injection. Also wait 15 minutes and measure the wheel and flare. So allergy skin testing is considered the 
more reliable, it's more rapid in terms of having results right there in the office. It's more sensitive and specific um, compared to in vitro testing, which I'll show in a moment, um, at least 85%, and cost effective overall. The other option is in vitro testing done uh, by ELISA now. It used to be done by RAST. RAST is really no longer used and is a misnomer if you use RAST, um, the word RAST now. So we like to call it serum-specific IgE testing. And much the same, we take a panel of environmental allergens and with that blood sample measured by ELISA, measure levels of IgE, specific IgE. But for environmental allergy testing, the Sensitivity has a wide range and the specificity also has a wide range and this is dependent on the materials used and the method. So again, we prefer to do skin testing whenever possible. But you would choose in vitro testing if the patient has a history of a life-threatening reaction perhaps on prior skin testing or you have reason to suspect that they may have um, a reaction to testing. Or they have a, a condition that would interfere with interpretation of the skin test results, such as atopic dermatitis, they don't have a good uh, area of skin to test. Or if they're dermatographic, you won't get reliable results. They'll have a positive um, diluent control. Any patient that you would not like to provoke a reaction, a systemic reaction, and you'd also choose in vitro testing, so that could include pregnant women, patients with cardiac disease, someone who is on a beta blocker, because if you have the, a rare systemic reaction to immunotherapy and want to use epinephrine, that may interfere with that, or a patient with uncontrolled asthma. So actually, if a patient comes in with severe asthma at the first visit, we may postpone skin testing or choose to do in vitro testing. If the patient has a non-reactive histamine control, meaning there may be a medication that's interfering with the uh, response in the skin, um, Sometimes that's explainable, sometimes not. Uh, we would choose in vitro testing. Now the typical aeroallergens that we test for include the tree pollens, grass pollens, weeds, dust mites, cockroach, animals, and molds. And this slide also shows you the seasons that relate to that. So um, again, thinking of the clinical correlation, say, if, well, if their asthma exacerbation occurs in April to May and they are allergic to birch, well, that would be relevant. Um, if they are reactive to CAT and that's their exposure, that makes sense. So these are the items we generally test. So allergen immunotherapy is indicated again for IgE-mediated disorders. Without, with an inadequate response to medication or allergen avoidance, those are still the first line treatments. Uh, the true indications are allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, allergen-induced asthma, so you're looking for that clinical correlation. Um, also, hymenoptera or fire ant hypersensitivity and atopic dermatitis with aeroallergen sensitization. Contraindications include significant immunodeficiency. Maybe you don't want to tinker with their immune, uh, immune system, or maybe you would expect it not to respond to treatment. Malignancy, cardiovascular disease in the sense that you would not want to do immunotherapy in a patient who, if they have a reaction, may not be able to tolerate a reaction or treatment with epinephrine. Or a patient with severe obstructive lung disease, again, they may not be able to tolerate a reaction. Patients who have poor compliance with medications also you would consider closely. Sometimes the poor compliance with medications is because they can't stand taking inhalers or, or pills every day and do, would do better with a shot. But on the other hand, if they are not likely to follow up on the schedule for immunotherapy, that's a risk for reactions. Treatment with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors is um, relative, a relative contraindication. Um, the idea is that beta blockers, if present, can interfere with treatment for a reaction. They don't interfere with actual um, immunotherapy. Uh, ACE inhibitors also have been shown to provoke an increased risk of reaction to venom immunotherapy. So if the patient can be switched off of those, that would be best. In pregnancy, we can continue immunotherapy, but we do not start allergy immunotherapy, again, because the risk of a reaction is higher when we're in the buildup phase, and that would be the one adverse effect we'd like to avoid. 
Now, the material that's used, um, the allergen extracts, they're prepared by aqueous extraction of the natural pollens, animal dander, fungal spores, house dust mite, fecal particles, because it is the fecal particles we're allergic to with dust mites, and the insect venoms. So the various companies that create these actually use the natural materials, which can appeal to our patients who prefer some type of natural treatment. The, uh, some of the extracts are standardized, including cat, dust mites, ragweed, grasses, and venoms, meaning that the allergen content is standardized, so you really can um, compare them, you, can, you know what you're getting. And the units are a little bit archaic, but they're known as BAUs, AUs. The non-standardized extracts have units known as PNUs, also weight per volume. But the non-standardized extracts can really vary, even from the same manufacturer, lot to lot. The BAUs are the most, um, uh, I guess, accurate type of unit, but even then, those are determined clinically with patients who are known to be allergic. It's, um, a, a, it's an interdermal process measuring a certain amount of reactivity, and you assign a unit to that, so clinically based too. And we want to make the formula for each patient based on their positive allergy tests. In some practices, the vials are actually individually made. Um, in many ways, that's preferred in terms of safety, but there are other methods where it's known as off the board, where a shot is created during that visit, just take a little of what you need, or um, shared specific vials. So there are a few different methods to preparing the treatment set for the patient. Uh, in the past 10 years or more, there's been an effort to try to standardize the treatment, but I think because it's been around for 102 years, um, it, it developed you know, in different ways, in different regions, different practices. There's a little bit of art to immunotherapy. But some effective dose ranges have been established. So this gives you an idea, and this comes from the um, allergy practice parameter. So for dust mites, the, the manufacturer's extract comes in a variety of concentrations and the probable effective dose range, based on uh, research studies, clinical efficacy, um, has a large range. Same for some of these other items, cat, grass, and then it's a little bit harder to determine with those non-standardized extracts. And this is why, from practice to practice, you'll see a variation in the actual formula, dose, why you can't necessarily just transfer a patient from practice to practice. It's, it's very frustrating for everyone, really, um, for both us and the patient, but this is the reason. Every practice has you know, learned over time what works for them and um, how they like to do it. And sometimes it can be converted and sometimes it can't. So uh, an example formula, if this patient is allergic to birch, cedar, oak, grass, ragweed, dust mites, cat and dog, very typical situation. Um, if we're going to make a 10 milliliter vial you can fit certain things um, together. Uh, certain things have to go um, separately. But based on those effective dose ranges, and uh, by the way, that means in the final, in the actual weekly or monthly dose, um, that was, that's the amount of allergen given in the maintenance injection. Um, you calculate back and you come, with a, come up with a volume, sort of a recipe, and so you, um, you create your vial based on those volumes and effective doses. Um, certain things should not go together. This patient does not have cockroach or mold in their formula, but those have cockroach and mold extracts have some um, protease activity, so you don't mix those with pollens, you don't mix those with cat and dog. Dust mite is sort of neutral that way. So there's a few rules for how we do this. A treatment set can look like this. Again, with that effort to try to standardize treatment, um, the the method rec recommended in the practice parameter includes defining the dilutions and concentrations and as well as color coding. So the lowest dilution has a green cap, then the next is blue, yellow, and the final maintenance concentration is known as red or one-to-one, -one, vial one maintenance concentrate. But um, sometimes we'll get patients from an outside practice and maybe the top concentration is the green bottle, because that green means go or something. So you still have to look very carefully at records when you're trying to uh, uh, change a patient from one practice to another. But we follow this method. 
Now, um, an example treatment schedule is shown here. So we start at the lowest dilutions and start with tiny doses. And generally, it's one to two times per week. Um, at Mass General, we happen to do once per week. But one to two times a week, building up gradually through the doses and finally up to the maintenance dose. And again, this is a sample schedule. You can have different doses, different repeats inserted in there. And the average buildup phase takes three months to eight months, depending on how often it's given, any adjustments that might need to be made along the way. And once the maintenance dose is, is well, actually, before I go to that, there are a couple of different variations in how you can do this, known as cluster or rush immunotherapy. And these are ways to speed it up a little bit. Cluster, um, the patient comes in for several injections at increasing doses in a single day or a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. And that way you can shorten the buildup phase by that amount. But there is some increased risk for a reaction in that. With rush immunotherapy, you have increasing doses at intervals between 15 minutes to an hour over one to three days to get all the way to maintenance in a matter of days. But there is a higher rate of systemic reactions when you're treating for aeroallergens, although there is not for venom. So venom immunotherapy, the rush protocol is, is um, prefer preferred in many cases. So once you reach the maintenance dose, and that's defined as the dose that provides efficacy without significant local or systemic reactions, okay? Um, that's when you can expect some improvement. Some patients will show some improvement um, earlier than that, but this is where you're hoping to see that effect. Uh, so the maintenance dose, generally each practice has a protocol aiming to a certain dose, 0.4, sometimes it's 0.5. But you might reduce that along the way if the patient's having problems. Not every patient requires that standard dose. Um, once you've reached the maintenance dose, you could make the schedule easier on the patient, and that can be extended to two weeks or most commonly four weeks between injections. <coughs> and counting from that time they reach the maintenance dose, the duration of treatment is three to five years. Um, uh, it takes, uh, Aidan may have this in his lecture, but three years is what we expect to really um, accomplish some of those immune changes to have a lasting effect, and we go for four or five years um, depending on the, their response to immunotherapy or how severe their, the problem was in the beginning. But the response to treatment is defined by the patient's clinical response. We just ask them, what do you think? How do you feel? Have you had fewer sinus infections, fewer asthma exacerbations? We don't need to do repeat skin testing. In fact, it, it won't necessarily reflect their response to immunotherapy. And there's no other markers to show um, if they've responded or any markers to predict. It's always preferred to give the treatment in the office of the prescribing physician who can control uh, what's going on and what dose adjustments might need to be made, but at least the treatment must be given in a medical facility under the supervision of a trained physician or PA or NP um, with the equipment ready to treat a systemic reaction or anaphylaxis. You don't need to have a code cart, doesn't need to be hospital-based, but at least you must have treatment um, in place, especially epinephrine available to treat any reaction. So I'll just talk about what type of reactions can happen. Local reactions are not dangerous. They are um, uh, not serious. This is defined as warmth or erythema and swelling at the site of the injection. These happen commonly. Um, 26 to 82 percent of patients can experience a local reaction. And uh, a large local reaction, is, is, you can still hear me? A large local reaction are more than four centimeters in diameter, persisting beyond 24 hours. And that's when uh, you would consider premedicating or decreasing the dose or rate of buildup, more for patient comfort and not necessarily because of risk. And it's been looked at closely as to whether we need to adjust based on large local reactions. They, there's a couple of classic studies, one that looked at um, whether large local reactions do predict future systemic allergic reactions, but did not show that. Yet another study looked back, a retrospective study, and those patients who had a systemic reaction actually did have a greater frequency of local reactions. So in practice, um, many of us do adjust based on large local reactions, at least repeating the dose, if not reducing. 
Now, systemic reactions are the um, more serious kind, and that's what we're trying to avoid, but we're prepared for. So we have the patients stay for 30 minutes after their shot, because normally a life-threatening or serious reaction should begin within that time. It is possible to have a reaction beyond the 30 minutes, but that's our guideline. Uh, and it can be any sign of an allergic uh, reaction, whether that's increased rhinitis or asthma or hives or swelling or GI symptoms, cardiovascular, in the worst case, hypotension and syncope. The incidence of systemic reactions is about one in a thousand injections, but that's including um, just having a little bit of rhinitis. Three to four percent of those would be severe. And um, the statistic is that less than one to five percent of patients receiving conventional immunotherapy would have a reaction, although rush aeroallergen immunotherapy, uh, more than 34 percent of patients can have it. So that's why we generally avoid rush aeroallergen immunotherapy. Now, based on um, retrospective surveys, uh, the incidence of fatal reactions in North America was counted up from 1990 to 2001. There were 41 fatal reactions, which calculates to one per two and a half million injections, which I'll quote to the patient. Um, from 2001 to 2007, six fatal reactions were reported. And from 2008 to 2011, no fatal reactions were reported. Now, skeptics would say that's because this is based on self-report, so there could be uh, fatal reactions that simply weren't reported. But the more optimistic uh, assumption is that we are recognizing and screening for uh, risk factors for reactions when the patients come for their shots. And so we want to always check if they have asthma. Is their asthma symptomatic that day? We're not going to give the shot. If their allergic rhinitis is exacerbated and they're having increased symptoms, you also would not give their uh, shot that day. Patients who have a higher degree of hypersensitivity, perhaps you can get base that on their test, although the test results don't necessarily correlate with clinical reactivity, but you may be a little more wary of someone who seemed to be um, more reactive to testing and start them lower. The use of beta blockers and possibly ACE inhibitors can affect um, the risk of reaction. And on our side, a dosing error certainly raises the risk for reactions or um, injection from a new vial. Any time the patient gets a new supply of their immunotherapy extract, it can be more potent because it has not been diluted, hasn't been sitting for six months. So we always reduce the dose for an injection from the new vial and raise that again. Patients who've had a previous systemic reaction are more at risk for another systemic reaction. Now, once they, if they're having a reaction, the risk factors for a fatal reaction is delay or failure to administer epinephrine. We always emphasize epinephrine as the first treatment. We know we just gave them something they're allergic to, so there's really no doubt that they are having an allergic reaction, and if there's any systemic sign, go ahead and give the epinephrine. If the patient did not stay in the office for the full 30 minutes, there is more risk that if they have a reaction without prompt treatment, it could progress. And in some cases, administration of the injections somewhere else, such as at home, where there's no one there to assist in, in case of a reaction. So in summary, uh, for prescribing immunotherapy, we want to confirm the presence of specific IgE antibodies by testing, skin testing preferred for uh, environmentals, and, uh, but in vitro is also possible. We want to confirm the correlation with clinical symptoms and exposure by history, timing during the year, what type of exposures do they have to match up with their symptoms. And I explain the method and protocol for subcutaneous immunotherapy and some of the risks. And I'll turn it over to Aiden for some more information on the benefits and efficacy. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, thanks, John and Ellen, for setting this up. I realize there's no time left, Chris, so we could. Um, you heard that allergen immun immunotherapy, uh, Ellen and John stated it very nicely, we're injecting complex materials to which the patient react to some of the proteins, and the efficacy has been linked to the content of the most, most allergenic protein in those things. Ellen has described subcutaneous immunotherapy, where there's a buildup by injection and then a maintenance dose given subcutaneously. What we're going to look at is the efficacy of this, as John said, skit, and compare it to sublingual immunotherapy. Sublingual immunotherapy developed a vogue in the early part of this 
uh, century, the early 2000s in Europe, and uh, uh, these days about 80% of immune therapy in Europe is sublingual. In the US, it hasn't taken off as much. In the last year, there's been available commercial products for sublingual immunotherapy. These, instead of being liquid extracts that were used in Europe, the same as we use for injections, dropped under the tongue. Uh, the FDA in 2014 approved um, three commercial products that were freeze-dried extracts in uh, rapidly dissolving sublingual tablets. We're going to talk about how those work. When we look at the efficacy uh, or the value of any therapy, we need to think of it in, in three domains. The efficacy is what's really determined by randomized controlled trials. So most of the literature that you see will be de determining efficacy. Is there a signal? So most of what I'm going to show you is related to the published literature, but in the real world we need to know is it effective, and that's really determined by the patient over time observing it, and is it efficient? Is this a cost-effective way of treating? We're going to touch on these uh, with a major focus here. Um, and the cost efficiency not, it not includes more than just the direct cost. It can also include indirect costs such as absenteeism or productivity and quality of life. There have been many, many uh, studies of immunotherapy. There have been many meta-analyses of immunotherapy, many, many um, uh, reviews of this. The most comprehensive one was produced by the Agency for Health Quality Research in 2011, uh, and that summarized the data up to 2011. This was before the introduction of tablet immunotherapy sublingually. Um, it looked at 74 studies of subcutaneous immunotherapy, 60 studies of sublingual immunotherapy, and eight studies that compared both, and all 142 studies were randomized controlled trials. This was a very comprehensive review. It's a several hundred page document. I'm going to very quickly take you through the high points of that and conclude that both of these therapies are very effective, both in allergic rhinitis and asthma, and then end up comparing them. So uh, you're going to see uh, these studies were all high quality. They, as Ellen mentioned, they required to be confirmed that allergic rhinitis was skin test or RAS positive, specific IgE positive, um, definitely had asthma. Uh, they only looked at those extracts that might be available in the USA. Remember, before tablets, the commercial extracts for subcutaneous immunotherapy were used for sublingual when there was a valid comparator and valid outcomes you're going to hear about evidence. They classify the evidence into four grades. High grade means this is the word of God. This is high quality evidence that's very unlikely to be changed by future studies. Moderate evidence was, this is pretty good. Uh, it may be changed, but so far it's pretty good. Low grade evidence was, meh, not sure this is any good. And insufficient evidence was pretty dodgy. Okay, so those are the four categories we're going to see. If you look first of all now at those studies looking at subcutaneous immunotherapy, in asthma, looking at outcomes such as asthma symptoms, asthma medication scores, and each of these slides, this will be the number of clinical trials looked at, the number of patients, the allergens looked at, and for example, asthma symptoms in 16 trials, they concluded high evidence that subcutaneous immunotherapy improves asthma symptom scores. High evidence that subcutaneous immunotherapy improves asthma medication scores. High evidence that it includes combined asthma and rhinitis symptom scores. Looking at subcutaneous immunotherapy in allergic rhinitis, high evidence that it improves uh, combination scores, conjunctival scores, and high evidence that it improves uh, combined scores as well as medication scores. Lots of high-level evidence, a little bit of moderate-level evidence for subcutaneous immunotherapy. Focusing on asthma, however, if you look not only at the symptoms of medications, but secondary outcomes that they didn't really grade, such as lung function, specific allergen bronchial reactivity, or nonspecific, such as methacholine, what you see is that there's not much evidence for improvement in lung function from subcutaneous immunotherapy or in methacholine responsiveness, but most of the studies did see significant reduction in allergen-specific bronchial reactivity. So in terms of asthma, you see improvement in medication scores, improvement in symptom scores, and incre increase 
in allergen, a decrease in allergen-specific bronchial reactivity. For example, here was one study from the early 2000s that showed after immunotherapy, the dose of allergen to cause a 20% drop in FEV1 increased in the treatment group, whereas the methacholine responsiveness was the same before and after treatment. Um, other, other pieces of information that are relevant to subcutaneous immunotherapy that it can prevent the progression uh, from allergic rhinitis uh, to asthma. There were some early studies suggesting this, uh, and then we're going to look at and look at one of them that actually documented this. So, um, a group of patients um, who, after immunotherapy, so who received immunotherapy uh, and uh, later were f assessed for asthma, those who had received immunotherapy, the majority had not developed asthma, whereas the control group, the ratio between those who did and didn't was much more close to equity. And a follow-up study from this group suggested that this effect persisted for seven years. Now, this has been followed up just last month by a very large retrospective study from the German National Health Service, where they looked at um, several thousand people who in the year 2005 had allergic rhinitis. In the year 2006, some of those went on immunotherapy, some did not, and they followed those people for six years, and they found a, a substantial reduction, a risk ratio of 0.6 or one-third reduction in the risk of developing incident asthma in the six years in those who went on immunotherapy compared to those who didn't. So preventing new sensitizations, preventing the development of asthma if you have allergic rhinitis, sorry, um, so for subcutaneous immunotherapy, high-grade evidence that it reduces asthma symptoms, asthma medications, high-grade evidence that it helps with allergic rhinitis. Uh, majority, here's what's interesting. The majority of these studies used a single allergen. As Ellen mentioned to you, the common practice is to include multiple allergens, and the average in the U.S. is eight. However, very few trials have shown that. We know by clinical experience that it works, but the documentation isn't uh, really there, and much less data for children. Moving to sublingual immunotherapy, again, the same type of setup. This is the outcome, asthma symptoms, the number of trials, the number of patients, the allergens used. You'll see there's high-level evidence that sublingual immunotherapy improves asthma symptoms, high-level evidence that improves rhinoconjunctivitis symptoms, moderate evidence for a combination of symptoms, you group them together. Um, moderate evidence that improves medication use. Unfortunately, the sublinguals didn't distinguish between medication use for rhinitis, medication use for asthma, but the signal is still there. So interesting, good level, for, good level evidence for sublingual, not quite as high as the evidence for subcutaneous. Um, sublingual uh, uh, therapy also looking at pulmonary function testing. In contrast, to the subcutaneous seems to be a better signal with pulmonary function, and similar to subcutaneous, a consistent improvement in allergen-specific bronchial reactivity. So the sublingual immunotherapy also seems efficacious. The overall strength of evidence is moderate rather than high now. The sublingual immunotherapy improves both allergic rhinitis and asthma. High-grade evidence for asthma may be more effective in asthma than in allergic rhinitis. Moderate grade evidence for combinations of symptoms. There is consistency across the uh, uh, inobserved benefits across outcomes for both sublingual and subcutaneous, and in mixed and pediatric populations only. The direction of the effect largely favors immunotherapy across all outcomes. So it seems like what we're doing is efficacious. What they're doing in Europe seems to be efficacious. What this uh, meta analysis did not address was the wide range of variation in method of administration dosage, and combination of allergens. Um, when we look at the head-to-head -head study, so here we're looking at subcutaneous versus sublingual. There were really four studies that looked at um, asthma outcomes. One was in adults, three were in children. Again, uh, small numbers of patients here. And the, what you see is that they're in the adults, and it's hard to see here, they're comparing before to after. The reduction for subcutaneous and asthma symptom scores was much greater than the reduction for sublingual and asthma symptom scores, and the same went for medication use. But overall, there was a reduction in symptom scores with SCIT, um, 
but not for slit and, and, and reduction in both in medication for skit and slit, suggesting that subcutaneous was slightly better than sublingual. Similarly, in the pediatric studies, um, only one of the three was really very effective, uh, and skit was found to be superior to sublingual. So the message here, they're both effective, but the impact, the, the degree of improvement with sublingual seems to be less than it is with subcutaneous using sublingual drops. So to summarize that, both have a proven effectiveness in allergic rhinitis and asthma. The direct comparisons are few. The magnitude of effect is greater for subcutaneous and for sublingual. However, the lesser frequency and severity of systemic reactions allow, and, uh, which allows slit to be home administered is a home administered is a benefit. And uh, what's interesting, subcutaneous, but never for slit, has it been demonstrated that mixtures of multiple allergens will be effective. So the data is not there, but it's clearly being done. Um, when you look, uh, again, this is looking at subcutaneous versus slit in terms of the, the size of the effect. This is the, what's called the uh, standardized mean difference. And, and uh, in this ratio, what's compared is uh, the means of the two arms divided by the pool standard deviation. And it's been felt that a value of about minus 0.8 is a large effect, minus 0.4 is a moderate effect, minus 0.2 is a mild effect. For, for, for subcutaneous immunotherapy in allergic rhinitis, the magnitude of effect in symptoms is quite high, whereas in sublingual, it's not quite so high, and the same for medication use. Again, confirming that the efficacy seems to be superior for subcutaneous than for sublingual. Uh, as John mentioned, the immunologic changes seen in, in immunotherapy, I summarize by saying they've all been shown for sublingual as well. The same effects have been shown. So the mechanism at least the immunological changes seem to be similar. Uh, what happened here? Sorry. We went back there somewhere. Sorry. And then the world changed. The FDA approved sublingual immunotherapy. Three sublingual tablets. Two for grass pollen, one for ragweed were approved in 2014. And um, these are all uh, approved for children over the age 10, five, and, and except for the ragweed tech, only for adults. These, these are sublingual tablets administered daily, pre-seasonally, between three to four months before the season, and co-seasonally, then stopped and resumed. Um, I won't say too much more about it. This is from the product insert. Um, the effect of the sublingual tablets seems to increase as time goes on. So the magnitude of effect in symptom score or medication score is bigger in the second year than the first year. A meta-analysis looking at that for sublingual immunotherapy showed that in studies that went for more than one month, the magnitude of effect, remember the standardized mean difference is 0.7 if you stayed on the treatment for more than 12 months versus 0.5 for less, and the same for medication scores. So the benefit increases over time. Practically, it has a sublingual has a clear advantage because of safety. There have been about 12 anaphylactic reactions total in the world reported, no uh, deaths. Um, it can be given at home after the first dose. A significant proportion, about 25 to 30 percent, get oral symptoms for the first several weeks. This stops after that. It does not recur in the second and third year. Um, the adherence you would think would be a lot better for sublingual than subcutaneous. In fact, it's not any better. Some studies showing less good adherence to sublingual than to subcutaneous. Um, single allergen slit retains efficacy even in polysensitized individuals, but there have been no studies that multiple allergen sublingual is effective, and most patients <laughs> require eight in subcutaneous. Um, this product is more costly, but it does require fewer office nursing visits. Um, there was, early this year, a large um, review of the efficacy of the sublingual tablets. So the earlier review was sublingual liquid. This is sublingual tablets. This is in JAMA from August, about 13 clinical trials. Because of time, I'm going to jump to the conclusion. And the conclusion was, and this is supported by an editorial, that the um, grass pollen allergy immunotherapy tablets show an, show an effect, but its magnitude is small, it's complicated by adverse events, largely local itching in the mouth. Now, this was a bit harsh. Therefore, the convenience and ease of administration does not seem to be sufficient reasons for the choice of sublingual immunotherapy tablets. Not a very resounding 
um, endorsement of that, and the editorial did nothing to improve the situation. So, asthma grand rounds, where does it fit? What do the guidelines say about immunotherapy? Well, you'll see this is the 2007 guidelines that we have this stepwise increase in medications, and across the bottom here, it says, for steps two to four, consider subcutaneous allergen immunotherapy. Um, we had a grand rounds here last year looking at the guidelines, and Carlos Camargo indicated what areas will be revised in the next uh, iter utterance, iteration of the guidelines, and immunotherapy will not be addressed. So that's going to stand. Consider it somewhere in step two to four. You might ask the question, what, how does this compare to other therapies? Well, there have been no head-to-head -head trials with medications, so we don't know how it would compare to inhaled steroids or combination therapies or to any of the biologics. You might ask, what, what are the real-world data for immunotherapy about asthma exacerbation reduction? That's what most of the novel therapies show now. We don't have any data on that. Uh, why are there no data for severe asthma? The simple answer is immunotherapy is contraindicated in severe asthma, and asthma can get worse as a result of immunotherapy. Um, I won't belabor that on these slides. So even though the uh, data for sublingual immunotherapy show efficacy, it's not resounding, it's not well endorsed, you might ask the question, are we losing something by lumping all this together. After all, most of the studies were done with pollen, grass pollen and ragweed pollen. And we don't think most of our asthmatics are in trouble because of grass pollen and ragweed pollen. Dust might be another story. And if you look more closely, there may indeed be something worth focusing on if you look at dust mites. Here was a meta-analysis which confirmed, was purported to confirm a lesser effect um, on, uh, on asthma than rhinitis, and with the SMDs being quite impressive. But if you scroll down and look here for dust mites, the benefit was really quite impressive. So you may, it's very clear that the sublingual immunotherapy has, is different for different allergens, and dust mite may be quite different indeed. So dust mite, a bigger effect, more asthma is related to dust mites than ragweed and grass. Could there be something in there? Uh, then there was um, a study that came out last year asking that very question. What about dust mite sublingual immunotherapy in patients with asthma? And the outcome here was trying to see could they, could they reduce corticosteroids while maintaining asthma control in patients who had received 40 weeks of sublingual dust mite immunotherapy. Three doses. We don't quite know how these proprietary units relate. So we don't know how much dust mite was given, in fact. Um, these were mild to moderate asthmatic, 604, randomized one to one. They uh, all had the same, approximately the same dose of baseline inhaled corticosteroids. And after the 40 weeks during the reduction phase, you can see that at the highest dose, there was a significant reduction in the requirement for inhaled steroids while maintaining asthma controls. Uh, overall, 50% of this group were able to reduce their inhaled steroids, and 34% were able to completely discontinue inhaled steroids, implying there may be some benefit here. Uh, and these, uh, curiously, a subset analysis showed that the best outcomes were seen in the more severe patients. And not only was a reduction in inhaled steroids, but an improvement in quality of life. I want to take you back to a statement that John Costa made early in the, in the statement that allergen immunotherapy is the only therapeutic approach which is capable of modifying the natural evolution of diseases. We know from clinical care that it can induce long-term remission of allergic rhinitis. It can prevent progression to asthma in allergic rhinitis, may prevent new sensitizations. We want to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I think there may be something. And I think if we can do this better, if we can make it, immunotherapy, better, we may actually be able to achieve something in asthma with dust mite immunotherapies. The way you might make it better might be to make it safer by, for example, covering someone with anti-IG, allowing for more rapid escalation of doses. Um, you may be able to modify the allergen, in fact, Andy Luster and Dan Hamelovs and myself and the pulmonary folks are embarking a study of a modified allergen in conjunction with a TLR4 agonist in allergic asthma, looking at a segmental lung challenge. To see this, the benefit of this, it will it's less 
allergenic, more immunogenic, with a very active co-stimulant driving away from a TH2 response. Uh, doesn't, will not require dose escalation, small number of doses. The same goes for peptide immunotherapy, not reacting with IgE, just with T cells, no need for dose escalation, several uh, doses at all that's required, and alternative methods of administration of immunotherapy, such as intralymphatic, a very exciting prospect there, uh, or changing it to sublingual. So the ways to make immunotherapy safer and better may allow us to look more closely at asthma, particularly in dust mite allergic asthmatics. So over 100 years later, we're still really at the beginning here. And we should keep trying. This is a quote from um, an Irish author, Samuel Beckett. Ever tried? Ever failed? No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thank you uh, for terrific presentations and summary and review and even for a skeptic I found it very exciting and uh, the hour is late and uh, maybe we can just take a couple of questions for for rather than a full panel discussion uh, uh, open it up for a couple of questions from the audience and then we'll call it an afternoon All right, here's mine. So I see all these patients with a pet, say the pet dog, and they are sure that their pet dog does not bother them. They go around the pet dog, doesn't bother them, licks them, doesn't bother them. They do experience that they go around somebody else's dogs, other animals, and it seems to bother, it could cause an allergic asthmatic reaction. Are they deluding themselves because they love their pet? Or is it possible that part of their tolerance for their own specific animal has to do with the chronic exposure to that animal? And if so, how did they get desensitized? Was it orally, inhaled, or what? <laughs> they probably didn't get sensitized orally. <laughs> um, so the allergen, the major allergen in dog is highly conserved across all species, including wild dogs, you know, dingoes and wolves and foxes. They've all got the same protein. The protein is largely, largely salivary and in the sweat glands. Dogs tend to lick themselves, it dries onto the fur, becomes airborne and inhaled. So that's the method of sensitization. So there is no non-allergenic breed of dog. Now different dogs have different amounts of this protein. And it could be that the house they go to has a dog that's less clean, less well washed, or perhaps bigger, and that caused it. But it's not, they didn't actually become desensitized to their own dog more than to another dog. There's no evidence of different allergens causing the problem between different dogs. Anybody disagree with that? No. Other questions? Yes? I'm wondering how you guys discuss the prospect that a patient has bad allergies and bad asthma a nine-month or six-month trial for omelizumab versus one for allergen immunotherapy and the allergic patient, and how you, the discussion that you have with them and how you position those recommendations. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to answer first. So, um, so the, the, the question is, the patient with severe allergic rhinitis, severe asthma, who may want to go on allergen immunotherapy but can't really do so because of the severity of their asthma, Moderate, severe, yeah. How you position, how you position omelizumab versus allergic rhinitis. So how I position, and I'd be interested to hear the other comments, would be to start omelizumab in the hope of gaining some control, or at the very least making them less reactive to allergen immunotherapy, less prone to adverse reactions from allergen immunotherapy, and then do it in sequence. Do the omelizumab first, and then after stabilizing there, go on to allergen immunotherapy. That's what I would do, but maybe Ellen has a different approach. And, and that's what I would do if they are severe. But if they're moderate and they actually are reasonably controlled but we're looking for a long-term uh, treatment, I would explain that immunotherapy is the chance for that cure. So you can do, yes, it's prolonged three to five years, but maybe that's it. Whereas with omelizumab, that's forever. It only works as long as it's taken, as long as that's what their, the course of their asthma is. So I give them that choice. All right. Well, thank you very much for a terrific presentation. Great work, and thank you all for your attention and participation. Thank you.